Before Caesar's rise to power, the most powerful man in Rome was Pompey, a celebrated military commander who had conquered a lot of land in Africa, Spain, and the Eastern Mediterranean. Winning new territory for the Roman Empire also meant getting really rich personally. So Pompey started using his enormous wealth on new building projects in Rome, including the construction of the most spectacular building complex Rome had ever seen. The largest part of the project was a place for public entertainment, which Shakespeare calls Pompey's Theater. But the complex also included a large meeting chamber for the Senate, which is where the most dramatic scene of Shakespeare's play takes place. Construction projects like these weren't just for the good of Rome. They were also for self-promotion. Pompey had a large statue of himself erected in the Senate chambers in an attempt to cast his shadow over the Senate, both figuratively and literally. Even though Pompey was making a play for more personal power, the majority of the senators opposed him. They were united in their commitment to that most important of Republican principles, the belief that no single individual should obtain absolute power, the kind of power Pompey was trying to give himself. It was about this time that Julius Caesar came on the scene. He was from an important family, but they didn't have a lot of money or power. So Caesar had to fight his way to the top, using his great political instincts, his speaking ability, and his ruthless ambition. Pompey noticed Caesar's talents and took him under his wing. With Pompey's help, Caesar was elected consul, which was the highest position in the government. After serving his term in office as consul, Caesar managed to get himself appointed governor of the Roman province in southern Gaul, which we now call France. He knew that military victories could elevate him to the top rung of the political hierarchy in Rome. As it turned out, Caesar proved to be one of the greatest military commanders in history, and he conquered all of Gaul with a series of brilliant military campaigns over a period of several years. These conquests made Caesar a very rich man, but they also made him hugely popular with the people in Rome, and his soldiers were becoming very loyal to him. But this was exactly the kind of power and popularity that made Roman senators nervous, even Pompey. So they banded together and ordered Caesar to dissolve his armies and come back to Rome. Caesar knew that if he came back to Rome without his armies, he'd almost certainly be arrested in order to undermine his growing power. But it was illegal to bring your armies into Rome, so it would be the start of a civil war if he did. Then, one January day in 49 BCE, Caesar decided to cross the Rubicon River and re-enter Italy with his armies. The Rubicon wasn't a big river, but it was a big deal that Caesar crossed it. He was essentially declaring war on the Roman Senate. We still use the expression crossing the Rubicon today, which means going past a point of no return. And the phrase refers back to that fateful day. Not ready for such a bold move, Pompey and a majority of the senators fled Rome to protect themselves, leaving Caesar in charge of the government. It was the start of four years of civil war. As Shakespeare's play opens, that civil war has ended. Caesar is entering Rome to celebrate his victory over the last of the senatorial armies led by Pompey's son in Spain. With the civil war now over, everyone is wondering what will happen next. Will Rome return to its Republican ways with Caesar sharing power with senators and tribunes? Or will he decide to try to keep all the power for himself? <laughs>